Have you got a Bible there? Turn with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, if you don't have a Bible here, that's okay. Some people have got it on their phones and tablets. I could be, and, and, and I'm serious about this, it's really, really important, I think, in today's day and age that we actually go back to the Word of God, that we make sure that what we're hearing, whether it, I don't care if it's from me or anybody else, that it lines up with what the Word of God's actually teaching. Uh, because it's so... How many of you know today you could type in something like uh, faith into Google and you'll get 44 billion people's perspectives and opinions on what faith is and uh, maybe, just maybe, most likely a lot of it doesn't line up with the actual broader picture of what, you know, faith is not a switch you flick to get whatever it is you want when you want it because you want it. But I've been to websites where that's basically what faith is. It's a switch you flick. And, and I could say that with any topic or any uh, 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 issue to do with Christianity and faith. It's so important, people, that we get into this word. Um, I, I cannot stress that enough, and I bang on about it every week here, but we need to be in these ancient documents because it is getting twisted and distorted, and uh, we're, we're becoming less and less reliant on what God says and more on the opinions of man and what feels good. It's interesting, I was thinking about this the other day. You go back in earlier times, and uh, 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 m- most of civilization for most of human history has been led by some sense of the divine. They might not believe in the same God as us, but there's some sense of a divine being who we submitted to, and that divine being set the course for life, and there were rules, and you did, and you didn't, and so on. We kind of moved from there at a certain point, and science, remember the scientific revolution, and people started going, well, science now supersedes God, and so now it's all about science, and what science can prove, and so on, and in the end, science could never disprove the existence of God. As a matter of fact, it's a train that's taking us closer to the fact that there is a divine being, and that divine being seems to fit the character and nature of the one that's written about in this. But I feel like we're in a modern age now where we're kind of moving beyond the scientific and now it's really about feelings. God is feelings now and how you feel is the most dominant force of nature and and we build our world now not around the divine sense of God being there anymore, not around science. Now we're starting to build a world around how human beings feel. And uh, again, it's, it's a dangerous, slippery road. And so I'm just encouraging, we need to be people that are into this book. So, so I'm saying that because the next few weeks while we talk about finance as well, if, you don't, if it's not here, don't listen to me. Don't agree with me, okay? Uh, I'm not going to be able to cover every aspect of finances from a biblical perspective. I'm not going to be able to cover every area. I'm just honing in on a couple of, uh, of, of little things. But as time goes on, we'll, we'll revisit different areas. But I want you to know that it's got to come from here. It's got to be consistent with the Word of God. And the other thing is this. I know, I know for a fact that most of you are going to get up and walk out of here, and you're going to forget within 10 minutes just about everything that was said to you. Who's, who's going to amen that? It's just a fact. Don't, unless you're very different than me, um, we forget things. You know, that's why, again, I'm a fan of, you know, if, if the Lord speaks something to you, write it down straight away. We, you, you might not have a notepad, you've got a phone. As soon as a thought pops in, could be the Holy Spirit, whatever, write it down and go back and have a look at it. If there's a question you got or, or you, 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 you hear an important, write it down somewhere just to go over it and reinforce it and to not just go, okay, that sounds good. Now I know why I believe that as well. So I, I just want to encourage you. Bible's really important. Uh, if you're a note taker, take notes. If you're not, here's what happens. You walk out and you forget it. I can't tell you how many times the Lord has spoken something to me that I'm getting ready for a message and he'll just speak something while I'm driving in the car and I've learnt now, I pull over, get my phone out and I write that down in my notes because I know that I know that I know like the parable of the sower, the seed can get planted but guess what? Things come and take the seed away. Jesus said that. The seed is the word of God. It, it can go in but you know it can be taken away too so let's provide an environment in our own world where it doesn't. Amen? Okay, sweet. Uh, First Kings 17. I read a story the other day. There were two men and they were marooned on a desert island, deserted island, sorry. And one man's pacing back and forth. He's worried and scared. What's going to happen to us? We're going to die out here. The other guy's just kind of sitting back with his arms behind his head, just catching some rays on the beach. And the guy that's pacing back and forth, he says, aren't you afraid that we're about to die? And the other guy just hands behind his head, laying back, looking up, catching some sun. He says, no, I'm actually not, mate. He says, you see, I make $100,000 per week. And I tithe faithfully 10% of my salary to my church every single week of the year. I guarantee you my pastor's going to find me. (laughs) Okay, again, I'm getting that out there because it's another one of those awkward little things that the church is just after your money. We're not just after your money. And I'm not talking about money now because we're after your money. There's a bigger picture to that. And money has a lot to do with our spiritual life and where our heart is. Amen? 
Money has a lot to do with how, where our heart is, and we're going to look at some of that stuff in the coming weeks. But I just want to start by, by, by sharing this picture with you, giving you a bit of a picture of, of how I feel. First Kings 17, verse 8 to 15. It's Elijah, and it says, Then the word of the Lord came to him, came to Elijah, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. It's interesting, if you read the whole story completely, there's no indication that the widow actually knew that God had commanded her to provide food. Isn't that interesting? At no point do we read that she knew that she was commanded to do this, but God said to Elijah, I've commanded this woman to give and to supply what you need. And you know what? The devil's done a really interesting thing, hasn't he, in this day and age? There are certain topics that 20 years ago we would comfortably hear preached from a pulpit or talked about in church. Something's happened in society where certain topics are now becoming more and more uh, taboo, for lack of a better word. It starts out there. There are certain things we don't want to talk about in the workplace anymore, certain opinions you don't want to raise or perspectives you don't want to point out uh, in your workplace or in your school or whatever because it could have ramifications. And what I've, I've been thinking about this recently, it kind of sinks its way into church now where there are certain things that you don't often hear preached about anymore or talked about anymore. And it's a reaction to the fact that if we can make it awkward out there, it's amazing how it filters into church and all of a sudden we don't want to talk about certain things. If you have never read this book, read this collection of ancient documents, do yourself a favour, read it. Read it. There is every kind of aspect of life covered in this book. Relationships, uh, money, uh, marriage, uh, loneliness, uh, uh, depression, um, joy, victory, defeat, uh, boredom. It's all covered in here. There are tips and things in here that help us. This is not just a book that you pick up and read that connects with your spiritual life and the rest of your life is over here on the side, do what you please. It was never written as a book that's meant to just speak to your spiritual life. It was a book, a collection of ancient documents that were written as God gave wisdom to humans about the entirety of life. It's about all of our life, not just the spiritual stuff. And so get into this thing. But one thing I've noticed, and I did some research on it this week, money talk in churches in the last 10 years has declined and declined and declined and has become nearly non-existent in a lot of denominations and churches. And I thought about, well, why is that? Well, it's pretty easy, isn't it? Because everyone thinks the church wants your money. And when you see a preacher with a $44 billion jet, and standing up on a Sunday with $33,000 suits and rings and stuff, I kind of get it. I can understand how people outside the walls of church think that's all they're about. When you, when you uh, uh, hear of the scandal within church and people, um, and I'm not judging people, whatever, but you hear of the scandals and the stuff that goes on and the, the financial mismanagement, of course people think the church is after money. So because us pastors and leaders and churches are good people and we know we're not just after your money, what have we done? We've gone to the other extreme and we don't talk about it at all now. I, I was brought up in a church, not brought up in a church, I, I, I got saved and I used to be a, a, associated, a pastor in a church, where every week we had an offering talk. Every week, every seven days, you were going to get someone up here doing an offering talk and then we'd take up your tithes and offerings. Now, I felt uncomfortable about every week talking about money. Um, is there anything biblically wrong with it? I don't think so, but I was uncomfortable with it. I felt like it was too much of an emphasis on one part of life. So in one year, you were going to hear four messages on grace, five on relationships, three, but you're going to get 52 on giving money to the church. And I was uncomfortable with that. So what I've done is I've gone to the other extreme and made a decision that, well, I'm never going to talk about money in church. But you know what God's showing me? That extreme is wrong when, you got to, when you're banging on about it every week and it sounds like that's wrong. But he said, you know what, going to the other extreme and not, that's wrong too. And so I've just gone from one wrong extreme to a completely other wrong extreme, and I'm wrong. So I don't want to, uh, I, I, I want to avoid spending the whole morning making apologies for why I'm talking about money. And you have no idea inside of me how difficult it is not to just stand here and list all the reasons. As a matter of fact, when I was getting this message ready, it was really interesting. I thought, here I am, I'm ready to go. I sat down on Friday and I had a look at it and I went, this is 30 minutes of apologies. 
all I'm doing here is spending half an hour apologising for what I'm going to eventually have to do anyway. So let's just forget the apologies. If I have to apologise for anything, here's what I'll apologise for. I probably haven't talked about it enough. I probably haven't talked about it enough. Because it's a really, really important part of our world. There you go. Um, another apology out the way. Another thing squashed. And then it goes on. It says, so he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and he said, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, she called, uh, he called, and bring me please a loaf of bread, piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home, make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Wow. Wow. If I was Elijah, here's what I'm doing. You ever have those moments where you want to pull your words back? You know, they're out there and you can't do anything about it, but you just wish that I, 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 I've just said to her, go and give me some bread. And she says, hey, I don't have any. And I'm just making a meal for me and my son. I'm gonna, I would have felt terrible. As a matter of fact, I want to be honest with you. I feel right now like that guy saying to that woman who was in such lack and need, give me a bread. That's what I feel like standing in front of a church these days, saying to people in the climate we live in, hey, giving and generosity and, and money... Guess what? That's, I feel, I relate. I'm like Elijah. I'm not Elijah. Don't go cutting that and pasting it and going, Alan calls himself Elijah. He doesn't. But I feel for Elijah in that moment, and that's what I feel like right now. He said, he said to her, don't be afraid. Go home, do as you've said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself. Go to your son. This is what the Lord, God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. And watch this. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. God asked that woman to do something. And she did it. And at the end of the day, everything she was afraid of didn't come to pass. God actually met her in that moment and and, and met her need and released everything to her. One thing that stands out about this potentially awkward and seemingly irresponsible request from Elijah is that he doesn't come across apologetic about what he was asking the woman. He's not, apolo- he's not apologising. He's just going, this is what the word of the Lord says. And that's what I want to say to you this morning. I'm just going to give you what I believe the Bible teaches us. Again, I'm not going to cover every aspect of finance. There's so much. But I do want to cover what I think are the basic parts over the next handful of weeks. Is that okay? Good. You with me so far? No one wants to leave? No? Good. Sweet. Okay. Excellent. So as I said, I I had all these excuses ready, and so I got rid of all of those excuses. But here's the thing. Uh, At the end of the day, one of the big reasons why I didn't want to talk about church, uh, money in church, is because I don't want to add to the narrative that the church is only after your money. But I had a deeper think about that. And here's, here's what I thought. Do you really think that McDonald's just wants to save you time? Oh, seriously, do you really think that that fast food giant, all, all, that every, all they think about every day, the CEOs, the shareholders, all they think about is we just want to save people time so they don't have to get home and go to the cupboard and get them. We just want to save their time. Or do you think maybe they just kind of want your money? <laughs> hmm, I wonder. Do you really think the Weight Watchers just want you to get healthy? Do you really think that, that that's all they want? They see other, all they care about is that you... Look, I'm not saying that they don't. That's not part of what they do. But hey, at the end of the day, do you really think that all they care about is wanting to get you healthy? And if the money doesn't come in, we don't care. We will find another way to soldier on because we just want to see you healthy. I don't think so. Matter of fact, I did some research. In 2017, the CEO of Weight Watchers earned $33.4 million. Now, she got a bit of a payment on top of that. But in 2017, here's the average wage of a, C, of a CEO of, of the big retail and fast... This is retail and fast food. I'm talking retail and fast food. The average wage in 17 was $13.94 million for CEO. I've got a funny feeling that part of what they're doing is they just kind of want your money. They kind of want your money. Do you really think the Bunnings just want to give you the lowest possible price? Do you really think that seriously? They just want to give me... I walk in there, they just want to give me the lowest possible price. Aren't they wonderful? And I love Bunnings, by the way. I'm not mocking Bunnings. Do you really think Nike just want your feet to be more comfortable? Do you re- they just want your feet to be so comfortable and for you to pass the basketball like Michael Jordan. Do you really think Myers just want you to look your best? Do you really think that? They just want you to look your best. 
And it doesn't matter we don't care about money, profits. We just want you to look and feel your best. Be the best version of yourself. I don't think so. See, the bottom line, all of the shareholders, you know what the shareholders want? They just want your money. They just want to invest in a company that whatever they put in, they're going to take out more. They want your money. But here's the thing. I've never had a manager of any of those businesses stand in front of me as I walked out the door, the Bunnings manager, and go, oh, look, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry that I took your money for that. I'm so sorry that we had to charge you for that. But you're... I've never heard any of them apologise for the fact that they just want your money. And here's the thing. I've never seen a person get up in arms about it either. Have you ever seen anybody order a Big Mac? And then when the guy says that'll be $13.95 or whatever a Big Mac meal is these days, who knows? He says, you're kidding me. That's outrageous. Why do, you, why do you want my money? We don't see reactions like that anywhere in the world. But for some reason when it comes to church, we've got this totally different perspective about finances and about money. So by way of apology, I, I only apologise for not talking about it enough. Because here's what I know. We're living in a time and an age, and every one of you have been impacted by this, without a doubt, right? There's stuff going on in the financial world. Who's noticed that? Anyone noticed that? Things are changing. If you're a young person in this room, and you're about to leave home, and maybe you're saving money for a car, you know, maybe you've got $3,000 for a car. First thing you're going to have to do when you move out of home is make a decision. Do I buy a car with that, or do I buy a twin pack of lettuce? Because it's going to be about that price. It's going to be about that price by the time you get out of home. That's going to be your decision. What do I do? Because things are going up. Interest rates are going up. And if you turn on Channel 7, 9, 10, Sky Fox, whatever, there are prophets on there telling you this is how thus saith the, the channel, thus saith the world. Thou shalt tighten thy bootstraps. Thou shalt uh, go and, and, and do this with that. Or thou sh- and I'm not saying it's not wisdom. I'm not saying there's not some wisdom in that. But isn't it amazing how scary the financial world is sounding right now? Yet even though the financial systems of the world are changing and shuffling and we use wisdom within that, even though, the, guess what? God's way of handling and dealing with finances has never changed. God's ways have not changed. There's been a pandemic, coronavirus, and we've all suffered financially, yes. But God's ways haven't changed. There's been a flood in our community and we've been impacted and so on. God's ways haven't changed. This is the thing. We're in the world, but not of the world. But how often do we take all of our cues from the world in so many areas, including the financial area? See, the real problem in the church is not how much we do or don't talk about money necessarily. It's how we think about money. It's how we think about money. It's how we think. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Here's what Paul writes to the Romans. He says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says, then. Not an, before that, no. If you want to conform to the pattern of the world, go for it. But you're going to miss out on what's after then. But if you want to be transformed by renewing your mind, then. This is what he's saying. He says, then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Those two words, conform. That word conform in the Greek, it literally means this. To fashion oneself according to. So so to conform to the world means to look around at the world today and conform, fashion yourself to whatever the world is saying. Whatever the world is saying. So in other words, whatever's popular, whatever's culturally acceptable, whatever's going to get you the the marks or the runs on the board, look around externally so you're constantly changing your external form. You're like a chameleon. You're one colour over here, one colour there, and one colour there. He's saying you can live your life like that and just be constantly conformed to society, which means that, and we're seeing that in the church, aren't we? As society changes its opinion about things, the church changes its, we just want to conform like chameleons and make sure that we keep fitting in. He says, but that's not the way to do it. He says, what I want you to be is not conformed, I want you to be transformed. That word transform, it's, it's where we get our word um, metamorphosis. It's metamorpho is the word. You know metamorphosis, like a, a grub goes into a cocoon. This ugly little grub thing goes into this cocoon, wrestles and fights a bit, and comes out a totally new creature, this beautiful butterfly. This beautiful butterfly. It's totally transformed. And what he's saying here is that you don't want to be conformed to the way the world does things. You need to be transformed into something different. But he says the way you're transformed is this. You're transformed by renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. It's interesting. When I got saved, I was spiritually moved from one kingdom to another. I received the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are a bunch of things that happened spiritually when I got saved. But when I woke up the next day and I kicked my toe, I still wanted to scream. (laughs) 
Not everything about my life was instantly transformed that moment. There's this thing called walking out our salvation. Amen? God does amazing things in our life, but we have to walk that out. And that's the process of discipleship. We begin to walk out those things. And, and, and what we do is we, we get transformed. Transformation comes by changing the way you think, because the way you think is the way you live. And so he's saying here, if you stay thinking the same way the world does and you keep letting that be the majority voice, you will just conform to whatever... And if that's the case when it comes to finances, you should be worried. Yep, you probably should be worried. If you're going to do it the world's way and listen to everything the world has to say and take your, your P's and Q's from... Then, yep, you should be worried. But he's saying, I don't want you to live that way. I want you to be transformed by renewing your mind. Change the dominant voices and the dominant narratives and get into this, find out what does God have to say about things and then start living that out. And as you begin to live that out, transformation occurs then. So what's the dominant narrative? What's the dominant voice in our head? The problem is that, that, that we need to change the way we think about money. And, and, that, and I mean in the church as well. Because we still have people sitting in church that still feel like, I come here, I want spiritual stuff. Don't talk to me about money. Well, you can't get any more spiritual, to be honest, than your money. Here's the thing. We shouldn't have problem talking about money in church because Jesus had no problem whatsoever talking about money. Now, we don't know everything Jesus said. I think as John says, if all the books were written about everything he said and did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit selected certain things and said, this stuff needs to be recorded. People need to know this. There's 38 parables in the New Testament. 16 of those parables talk about money or finance or use money and finance as an illustration of something exposed in the human heart. One in every 10 New Testament verses talk about money and possessions. It's one in every 10. Every seven to nine verses in Luke, if you break it down, speaks about money. 500 verses... On prayer, and then there's less than 500 on faith, but there's over 200 verses on finances and prosperity. We don't want to talk about it, but it appears that God wants to talk about it because it reveals a lot of stuff that's going on inside of our heart, our relationship to finances. You ever notice how people are happy to talk about just about anything? And, you, and, and I'm not going to go at anyone, but let me just... Hey, how you going? What's your name? You, you're, no, I'm Alan. Are you married? Yeah, my wife Jackie. Come meet my wife Jackie. You got any kids? Yeah, I've got four kids. Great kids, yeah. Where do your kids go to school? Oh, they go to school here. Where do you live? Oh, we live over there. How much money do you earn? <laughs> hmm? Hey? A lot of nervous chuckles and shifting in chairs. Why is it? Why is it that we, will, we are happy to tell everybody all those other areas of our life, but we want to protect anything to do with money or finance or... How much is in your bank account? Now, I'm not saying we should run around telling everybody how much money we earn or how much is in our bank account. What I'm saying is, why is it that the natural instinct is we don't want to talk about that, but we're happy to talk about just about everything else to do with our life and share that with people, but we don't want to go there. That tells me that inside of us, somehow, on some level, somewhere, we hold that in some type of regard or protective state more so than even the ones we love more so than any other area of our life. I don't know why it is. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus said this. He tells a parable. And it starts with this. It said, Jesus told his disciples there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. That word wasting there literally means that he was just sort of throwing it in the air. So I want you to imagine this master's got these possessions. He gives them to this guy and goes, I'm entrusting these possessions to you, these money to you. And here's what the guy goes. He goes, woo Absolutely no regard for the value of what he's been given. Absolutely no thought process as to the purpose for why it was given to him. He's just <laughs> throwing money willy-nilly. And the master says, this ain't good. And so we go further down into verse 10 and 11. And here's what Jesus says. The master comes back and the master's not real happy with it all. And there's a couple of lessons in there. But I just want to show you what Jesus said at the end. He said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. We understand that, don't we? Because we treat our kids that way and we treat people that way. And if you own a business, you treat your employee, you trust them with a little, and, the, and then you, if you trust them with a little, you, you trust them more. And Jesus is saying that's exactly right. If you can trust someone with a little, you trust them with a bit. If I can trust you with a little bit of my story, I'll trust you with a bit more of my story. And if I can trust you with that, and it kind of we don't just go blah. We don't just give you, you, you don't walk into my business and I make you the CEO and pay you $33.4 million. No, no, you earn your way, you work your way up, we trust you and so on. Well, in some businesses, they probably do, actually. 
He says this, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. Watch this. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling what? Worldly wealth, mammon, money. If you've not been trustworthy or faithful, some translations say, in handling money, who's going to trust you with true riches? Who's going to trust you with true riches if I can't trust you? If, if God can't trust me with money, how can he trust me with true riches? What's interesting here is in our hearts, money is kind of true riches. We kind of hold it up. That's why we're so secretive. And it's, it's got a place in our heart. We live in a world where it is. It's hard to fight that off. It's just reality. But Jesus is saying here, money, pfft, I don't even classify it as true riches. I don't even classify money as true riches. Money is what I call the little. Money is just that tiny little starting point, but it's not true riches. And if I can't trust you to manage that properly, why would I give you any true riches? And it tells me this too, he's also watching how we manage it. He's watching. He's looking at us. When I get paid and I've got that money, you know what? God is interested and he's watching, going, show me how you handle the little. Show me how you handle little, because I'm really wanting to give you what I call true riches. But I want to know how you handle a little first. And if you can't handle it and manage it properly, and properly is according to the way God designed it to be handled and managed, and putting God into that. So if I can't do that, he said, I can't give you true riches. Who would like the opportunity to steward the healing power of God in their life? Well, I'll put my hands up. I would. I want to be able to, and I, haven't, and I want to see more of it. Pray for the sick and see them healed. I want to see those chains broken off people. And I want to see people restored and healed and then point them to Jesus, the one that healed them. I want to steward that kind of power. I want to steward that. That's a, that's a, that's a, I think that's, that, that, that's up there with the true riches because it gives glory to God. It, point, it breaks the chains of the enemy and it points people back to God. Who wants to uh, uh, steward the authority, more authority over demonic situations? You know there are things going on around your world. You can see your kids, your neighbours and stuff and you know that the enemy is in there having a go. And who would love more, uh, the capacity more to understand and to steward and to move in that authority and see those things broken off and people set free? I, I want to see more and more of that. Who wants to see a greater degree of wisdom of God? Who would love to see more of that, that divine wisdom, that, that stuff that's just otherworldly, the wisdom of God, the ability to see into a situation and know the right way to go and the right thing? I, I want to steward more of the wisdom of God in my life. Oh, oh, what about the, the capacity to disciple people better? Who wouldn't, who, how many people feel uh, awkward? And I know many of you do because you've told me. When we talk about discipleship and getting someone one-on-one, -on -one, so many people go, oh, I don't know, I'm so insecure and nervous and I don't know. And, oh. Wouldn't you love to just know that when you sat with somebody or you walked with somebody or did life with somebody, that you were reflecting the heart, the character, the nature of the Father to them and that they were catching it and that they were growing in their relationship with God? Who wouldn't want a steward that. I want to steward that. And I read this passage and go, I think that's closer to true riches, the stuff that has eternal power and eternal value and eternal impact. But if I can't manage the few dollars that go into my account each week, if I don't understand that God's given that to me for a purpose and that God actually has an idea about how I should do that, even though I know the, the finance books and all this stuff, they'll tell you to do this and ten, you know, I understand that. But God wants to get involved in that too. Deuteronomy tells me this. It says it's God that gave me the power. Deuteronomy 8, God has given me the power and the capacity to generate wealth. The very fact that you have money come into your account started with God giving you the ability, capacity and power to even be able to create it, make it happen in the first place. It comes from God. It comes from God. Now, God's never been locked into conventional wisdom. He says, forgive. And the world says, no, get even. It's not conventional wisdom the way God operates. God says give. The world says, no, 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 if you've got it, you hang on to it. And if you can take some off somebody else, go for it. Take it off them, get it. God says it's about giving. The world says it's about getting. God says bless those who curse you. The world says no. <laughs> they speak bad of me, you speak bad of them. You, you, you think, you, you said that about me? Well, wait till they tell, tell you something about him. Well, it's up the level a bit. That's, what, that's the world. God says humble yourself to be lifted up. Humble yourself to be... No, no, no. You put yourself out there. Tell everyone how great you are, everything you've achieved and how wonderful... You know, you, 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 do, you fight to get to the top. You play one-upmanship games. He says, look, you humble yourself. At the right time, I'll lift you up. 
And here's one thing I've found. When God, do, when God does this with his hand, I've never seen anyone say able to push his hand down. I've never seen it. Never seen it. He says, lose your life in order to find it. It's not conventional wisdom, is it? Lose your life, find it. If you want to live, he says, you've got to die. There's nothing about God that is completely conventional in the way that he sees things and does things. That's why as believers, we are, we're meant to be kind of countercultural. I'm not saying that means that we should be weird and freaky and you know, um, look like aliens with tinfoil. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is God, has a, God, God sees life this way and says, I made it, so I should know a few things. And I'm telling you, if you do it this way, that's going to work. You can go this way, but it's not going to have the same impact and the same effect. You need to do it this way. And we need to get in line with the wisdom of God. This shouldn't surprise us. Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Have you actually thought about that? Have you ever thought that your thoughts are not God's thoughts? You ever meditated on that? My thoughts are not your thoughts. And he goes on, he says, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And because God knows humans, because he knows what we would do with that, if we stop there, here's what, here's what God knows we would do. So God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. God's ways are different to my ways. His thoughts are different to my ways. They're just different. God knows humans. So he adds the next verse, and he says, just so you don't get it wrong, as the heavens are, what? Higher. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. My ways are higher. There's no room for us to go, God's ways are different. God's ways are not different, people. God's ways are higher. God's thoughts are not different. They're higher. Higher, 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 higher. Anyway, just song popped in then. Now, here's the thing. The path to discipleship is a journey towards accepting and living out the higher ways of God. That's what discipleship is. That's what this process of discipleship is. It's, it's, it's learning to accept and to live out God's higher ways. And of course, in order to do that, we've got to understand God's higher ways, don't we? We can't just sit back and keep conforming to the pattern of this world. We've got to be transformed by renewing our mind with God's higher ways. And that's the case in every area of life. But let me tell you, it's the way in finances as well. God's ways are higher, even though they may not sound like conventional wisdom. God's ways are higher. They're higher. Until we accept God's higher ways, we'll never truly walk in everything that God has in order. For... It's like this. Any, anyone ever surf? I know some people here surf. Um, I, was a, I, I used to surf when I was younger. I was never um, Kelly Slater or anything like that, but I used to love uh, going down to Flat Rock when we were at school. When I was at school, I had me and about five or six mates, and we would go to Flat Rock, and we would sleep uh, on the sand dunes there every Friday night. We'd finish school, come home, we'd sleep in the sand dunes, make a fire back in the days when you could do those things, kids could do things and not get in trouble for everything out there in the world. We'd sleep in the dunes, light a fire, and then as the sun would come up, as soon as we saw the first rays of the sun, we'd be straight out there because we wanted to be the first people out there surfing at Flat Rock. But here's the thing you notice when you go out surfing is that, that there'll be there's a point where the, where the waves are breaking and there's a really good spot to sit and you catch waves if you go there, but then you've, you've always got some guys sitting way over here. And, 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 and maybe they just don't want to be in the crowd, and I get it, don't want to be in the crowd, so they'll just go and sit over there. The problem is where they're sitting, there's actually no waves. Or if it, it does come, it just sort of peaks and breaks and there's nothing to do with that wave. If you want to catch that wave, you've got to be in the right position to do it, right? You've got to be in the right position to do it if you're going to catch that wave when you're surfing. If you're going to catch fish, you've got to be in the right position to catch fish. You've got to be in the right place. And you see, obedience to God is the same thing. If, if we want the full flow of, of, of God, and don't get me wrong here, we have the fullness of God, I've got no problem with that. But if we want God to get fully involved in all the areas of our life, we have to give God access to those areas. And the way we give God access to those areas is we live the way God says to live. We live the way God says to live. That's how we position ourselves, and that's how we get into that space. Obedience opens doors to God in your life. And as we get on board with his higher ways, we actually create environments that actually attract the activity of God. God's looking for obedience. And where he sees obedience, and, and you do not have to be a theologian to see that in this book. When people obeyed God and ran with God, it was amazing how the power of God was there and God did things in those spaces. When they disobeyed God, guess what? Things didn't happen so well, did they? 
I mean, you, you've got to be a very poor theologian to read this book and think that God's heart is not to bless his people. Like, you've got to be poor theologically to read this book, read these ancient documents, and come away going, oh, God just wants us all in the poverty line. God wants us all to have nothing. God, you, you have to be such a poor theologian to come to that conclusion. God wants to bless us. Blessing is more than money, by the way. But God wants to bless his people. God wants to prosper his people. But what he wants is for us to walk in obedience to him in those areas of our life so that he can bring into our world all that he wants to bring into our world. So here's the thing. God knew that that woman, he knew her situation. He knew that she didn't have a lot. But he commanded her to give anyway. Notice that? I mean, she had nothing. She, 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 she's there going, I'm going to die, have a meal. I'm, and God commanded her to give. And I know there are people sitting in churches who go, well, I can't give anything because I've got nothing. Well, this woman had nothing, yet God still spoke to her and said to give. She wasn't exempt from God's higher ways because of how much she had. Some have this, some have that. But God's ways work whether you got this or that. Matter of fact, it's amazing how many people got to that because when they were here, they did God's ways. Talk to some people. And the woman's situation didn't change because she knew what she had to do. It changed when she actually did it. Notice that? It changed when she actually did it. Just in finishing up, we'll go back to 1 Kings 17. I want to look at verse 11 to 13 again, just to close up. As she was going to get it, this is, this is, this is the water. Elijah calls her and says, bring me please a piece of bread. Surely as the Lord God lives, what did she say? I don't have any bread. Is that what she said? I don't have any bread. Only flour and so on. Then in verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. See, I think this is the number one reason why God, people don't trust God or walk financially the way God wants us to. Because the same as this woman, when she was told to give, first thing she says, I don't have. But Elijah said, no, no, it's not that you don't have. That's not the real reason. Because you do have bread. Later on, she goes home and makes bread, doesn't she? She actually goes and gives him bread. So she's gone, I've got no bread, but somehow, yes, yeah, she did have bread. She made him a loaf and gave him bread. She thought she didn't have. But the reason she thought she didn't have was because she was afraid. And that's the bottom line when it comes to money in our society today. A lot of people don't give. I'm talking to Christians. If you're not a believer here, I'm, I'm not necessarily talking to you, but I'm talking to people that, that follow God and, and say they live by this. Fear is the real problem. Will God really come through? Does, can I really trust God? I mean, I can trust God with my marriage, my kid, but can I really trust God with that, which is so important to me that I can't even talk about it with people? You know the number one reason why people in financial trouble don't go, go see financial planners? Same reason. They don't, nobody wants to talk about money. They would rather go down the tubes financially and end up in debt and try to work it out themselves than humble themselves and go to a financial planner and say, can you help me? It's amazing. It's amazing. She was afraid, and Elijah knew straight away, and he turns to her and he says, don't be afraid. You guys want to get up? I just want to finish with one quick song. And it's going to be that first one we sung. What was that first one? Call upon the Lord. Because I love there's a line in there about breaking every chain and shackles. And so we're just going to get into that real quick. But here's the thing. Elijah knew straight away what the problem was, and it was fear. And you know what? I think it's the same for many of us. We're afraid to take God at his word. We are afraid to uh, be generous. We're afraid to give because we look at what we've got and we go, I don't have enough, just like this woman. But here's the thing. God has made a promise to you. He's made a promise to you that he will meet all your needs. Amen? God is a God that said, I will supply to you whatever it is that you need. But what I want you to do is let me get involved in that part of your world so that I can actually be in a position to provide for you. Or you can be like those people that won't talk to a financial planner and try to work it all out yourself and do it all yourself. When all God is asking is, would you just do what I've... Matter of fact, without going there, you go, yeah, Malachi, where God talks about the tithe with Israel. And I don't want to get into a debate about that. But what I love about that is that it's about the only time where you hear him say, test me. Actually, test me. Every other thing, you know, don't test the Lord thy God. But with that, he said, look, I want you to test me. Why? Because I know that it's going to be... Martin Luther... The great reformer, he said this once. He said, every man or woman needs two conversions. One of the heart and one of the wallet. <laughs> one of the heart and one of the wallet. They're so intricately 
sewn together, particularly in the Western world where we have affluence and access and so on. This woman said, I've got nothing to give. Elijah said, yes, you do. The problem is not that you've got nothing to give, it's that you're afraid to be a giver. And I want to challenge you over these next few weeks while we talk. I want to challenge you. Look at what this says. And take a step of faith and trust God. And I'm not talking from a book. I'm talking from my own experience, by the way. We have had to learn lessons. I've probably got more. Marie's probably in a similar boat uh, from our time in Wildwind. We've got a lot of ex- uh, 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 miracles and stories where God has come through in ways that just seemed stupid and you wouldn't imagine. We were living in India one time and we're sitting around a table and we're eating rice and, and here we are, the great white missionaries to India to try to reach India for Jesus. Guess what? We ran out of money and had no food. We're sitting around a table, probably much like this woman, we were having just some plain rice and stuff. We get a knock on the door. Nobody knew about this but God. We hadn't told anyone, share with anyone. A knock on the door, open the door. Here's this Indian man, Indian woman. They were pastors of a church. They knock on our door, open the door. Here we are in India over there trying to save the Indians and this Indian couple are standing there with two bags of groceries going, the Lord spoke to us and told us to buy you food. (laughs) How does that happen? Well, I can tell you this. I think it happens because when you involve God in that part of your world and you start doing finances the way God says, it's like positioning yourself for the next wave. And trust me, God comes through. God comes through. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 10 says that now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. By the way, context, talking about money. Go and have a look later. Context is king. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed. It will enlarge your harvest of righteousness. He's speaking to a bunch of people that took up a generous financial donation, were giving away their money. And he says this to them. He says, you guys are sowers. You're giving. You're, you're blessing people financially. Now, he who supplies seed to the sow, in other words, God gave you seed to sow and bread for food. Here's the thing. I don't care how much you've got. You've got some bread in your bank account. Every seven days, you get a bit of bread in your wallet or a bit of bread in your account. You also get a bit of seed. Bread, do what you want with it. Eat it. Enjoy it. Cook it, put, make it toast, put peanut butter and Vegemite on it. I don't care, make double. Do what you want with the bread. Here's what I don't want you to do with the bread. You don't necessarily have to plant the bread. It doesn't really achieve much. Enjoy your bread. It's not a bad deal. God gives you 100% and then just says, give me a little bit back. But you can keep the rest. We, we, we've got a pretty good deal here. Okay? We'll expand on this in the coming weeks. What I want you to see here, though, is that he says, God gives you two things. He gives you bread and he gives you seed. Don't eat seed. Because every time you eat seed, you kill that seed's God-ordained purpose. There's a reason why that seed was given to you. Seeds to be sown, multiply, and produce stuff. And how many of you have noticed there's a world out there that doesn't know Jesus, that's drifting further away from Jesus, that needs some people to sow some stuff into the kingdom so we can get the word of God out to those people. So people can hear about the reality of God. You've got bread and you've got seed. I'll finish with this great statement. Someone said this once, if the modern church could get a handle on tithing and giving, it would change the Western church as we know it. What a great saying. If the modern church could get a handle on tithing and giving, it would change the Western church as we know it. No, it was not a word of faith preacher. It wasn't a guy with a jet, billions of dollars. It wasn't a pastor of a mega church anywhere in the world. Matter of fact, it wasn't even a Pentecostal. I know, shock horror. Non-Pentecostals talk about money. It was a man you may have heard of, Billy Graham. It's a quote from Billy Graham. If the Western church could get a grip and don't jump on the words tithing and giving, I just want you to see generosity. If the Western church could get a grip on sowing its seed instead of eating it, then it could change the church as we know it. Father, I want to thank you for this morning, Lord, and, and God, I know that, um, you know, we don't want to tread on toes or whatever, God, but we do want to, God, we want to live biblically and we want to understand what your word says. And uh, Father, I, I, I'm, I'm sure that everybody in this room, God, we want you to entrust us with true riches, God. We want to get past uh, some of us how we feel about money. God, we want to see it from your perspective. We want to understand finance from your perspective. And God, for some of us in this room, we we need to reposition ourselves. We need to get on board with the way that you say that we should manage money. God, we've got one life to live. We've got one shot at this. 
one chance to invest into the kingdom of God, one chance to invest into things that are of eternal value, things that moth and rust can't destroy. But Lord, I also believe that you've got incredible blessing that you want to pour out on your people, Lord. And maybe, God, just maybe for some of us, we're holding that back because we're saying to you, hey, we can do this ourselves. We don't need you. And so, God, this is an opportunity for us to get on board with you. And So, Lord, I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you um, just help people to process and to understand and to see where we're coming from, help them to get into the Word of God. Lord, over these next few weeks, Lord, bring the walls down. Bring walls down and open hearts to see how wonderful it is to do life with you, not just all the other stuff, but even to do a financial journey with you, God. It's amazing. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said...